Father, we just lift up this time, and Lord, we do, uh, God, we want to draw close to you. And I thank you, God, I thank you that we can gather. Here we are, the middle of the week, and, and uh, gathering together, we have that freedom. And Lord, I know oftentimes, I know I kind of just take it for granted, and Lord, we are blessed just to be able to get together as believers, and even to hang out with each other, greet one another, and then to be able to open your word and read your word. And we thank you. We thank you for the goodness and the grace in our lives and giving us this ability. And now we just pray, God, that we would hear you tonight. This is an incredible section of scripture. And Lord, I know it heals hurting and broken hearts. And God, I know it encourages strong and and, and faithful hearts. So I just ask, God, that you would do a mighty, mighty work here tonight and that each one of us could leave here so excited because we've been in the presence of our God and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, in this chapter, something about this, this section is, is dear to me. Uh, when I was at Bible college, this is, uh, I, I got to teach a couple times at, at the college, and this was the second passage I taught on. And I just remember the director, when I started to teach, said, you better handle that correctly, because there's a little bit of uh, stuff going on here. So I did it there, and I'm hopefully tonight I'll do it better than I did it then, because I was pretty bad back then. But anyway, hey, as we think about this, think about, once again, just let's remember, Luke is writing this. And I, I love reading the Gospel of Luke and Acts, just Luke's heart. Luke was, you know, he was, yes, he was a historian, but Luke gives us details that other people leave out, and especially the idea that Jesus hung out in people's homes. I kind of like that, right? He'd go, he'd go and, and especially going to dinner. He loved to go to dinner, and uh, kind of exciting things. So as we think about that, and then as we look at what we've been looking at so far in this chapter, this is an incredible, incredible chapter in the book of Luke. If you remember when we started out, the centurion who asked him to pray for his servant, right? And he goes, here's what the centurion said. Just speak the word. I trust you. You don't even need to go there. I know that you have that kind of power. Then he raised the widow's son, right? And, and raised him up. So just think about all of that's going on. Oh, and after he raised his son, do you remember what everybody said? Because it's important for tonight. Remember what they said? This must be a prophet. Oh, keep that in your head because that's important for tonight. Oh, and then, then John, John freaked out, right? Does that give you encouragement? Every time I read about John freaking out and having some doubts, it encourages me because I have doubts. And if John the Baptist doubted, Man, that's okay, right? But what did John do? He went to Jesus, right? And John got that encouragement. In the midst of that encouragement, Jesus kind of rebuked the Pharisees. And this is what's interesting to me about what we're reading tonight. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you Pharisees act like bratty children. That's pretty heavy, right? And so now... Now we get to this section, and we're looking at this section, and listen, Jesus is, is, is going to go to one of the Pharisees' houses for dinner. Is that nuts? Hey, you're a bratty kid. Can I come to your house for dinner? <laughs> and as we look at this now, I do have to give, I think I do have to give this disclaimer. This section in Luke is not the same story of the section in Matthew and Mark. That is a whole different place. Although same, same name, Simon, but in Matthew and Mark, it's Simon the leper. Here, it's Simon the Pharisee. A Pharisee would not be a leper. So we know they're different stories, and they're at different times. They're right before his crucifixion. This is early in his ministry. This is in Galilee. That was in Judea. So kind of keep that in mind, because some people say, well, it's the same story. One of them, you know, Luke just got messed up. No, it's not the same. It's not even close when you really begin to examine it. Oh, and then there's one more. In John, I think it's John chapter 12, John has another story of another event. So here's what I'm thinking. Man, Jesus was around these people a lot, right? And at dinner, and at dinner, ladies would show up. And in Matthew and, and Mark and even in John, 
She anointed his head with costly perfume, as we're going to read, but she anointed his head. Keep that in mind because it's not what's happening here. And the whole premise of those stories was about the waste, about the price. This one's not about the price. That's not even brought up. So having said that, I just want to make sure we understand that and that we kind of get a hold of what's going on here. So this is a whole different event. So it tells us in verse one, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. So this Pharisee, I, every time I read this, here's what I gotta think. Why'd this guy invite Jesus to dinner? He didn't love him. We're gonna see he didn't have that, that, that joy. And is he trying to set a trap? Is he curious? What, you know, what is going on in this guy's mind? I believe, listen, I believe something has to be going on in his mind because it's not out of gratitude for who Jesus is and for what he's done. That's gonna become very clear. So what was his motive? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on. And then it kind of bums me that in our translations, it says he came in and he sat down to eat. They did not sit down to eat. They reclined, right? Right? And it was important that we understand that. That's what always bumps me about the painting of the Last Supper. They're all sitting at this picnic table. That's what I think of when I see it. That's not how they ate. They would recline, and they would always recline on their left elbow, eat with their right hand. And part of that was because of, of, of defilement of the left hand. And I don't want to get into all what's going on there. If you've ever been in the in an Eastern culture, you know what I'm talking about. And so they would eat with their right hand and just, just kind of lounge there, but dinner took a long time. That part I like. I think it would be more fun to just kind of lounge and eat, don't you? Sitting and eating, you get full too fast. If you lounge, it can go all the way to your feet, <laughs> right? And you just kind of do that. So here they are, and so he wasn't sitting and it becomes important. He's lounging. So they have the, the, the low table, and you sit with your feet away from the table, right? Again, for cleanliness. Feet were defiled. Feet were funky in that day because you're wearing sandals. You're in the dirt. You don't want funky feet in your food. Sounds like a song. <laughs> Someone should write that song. Funky feet in food. But anyway, so... That's the scene we get. Oh, and then it tells us this. This is hard for us to imagine. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. So before we go on, it's kind of interesting. So this woman who was a sinner, I think Luke's trying to be polite. Right? I think this lady was a hooker. I think that's what she was as, as things are going on. And she shows up, and she shows up where? At the Pharisees for dinner? That's kind of weird. Now, she wasn't invited to the dinner, but here's, uh, you know, as you do research and you, and you read certain things, when anybody would have a kind of a dinner, and especially if they had a rabbi over, who Jesus was a rabbi, remember, he's a teacher, if they had one over, People could come and stand against the wall as you're having dinner to eavesdrop on your conversation and see if they can learn something. Is that weird? I mean, would you like to go to dinner with somebody and have people come stand around and watch you eat? I, I think I would be very uncomfortable. Like, what are you doing here? And then here's what's, here's what's strange about this one. Luke says she's a sinner. So here's what I, I believe. Everybody knew who she was. Everybody knew this lady, what she did, and who she was. That would be the last person you would want in your house as a Pharisee. And I think that's important to understand. And in saying that, here's what I'm trying to communicate. This took a lot of faith for this woman to walk into that house. Took a lot of faith for her to do that. And she walks in and it tells us, hey, she walks in and she's at his feet, she's behind him, and she's weeping. So again, I think, you know, whoever, whoever communicated this to Luke, remember Luke wasn't there, whoever communicated it to Luke, obviously she was in enough emotional turmoil 
that it was very obvious what she was doing, right? So she's weeping. She's behind. She's at the feet of Jesus because he's reclining away from the table. She's weeping. And then it says, and as she's weeping, she began to wash his feet with her tears. Now, that's just strange, isn't it? I mean, she's weeping. Why is she weeping? Why is this lady at his feet weeping? I believe for one reason. She knew who he was. Do you remember a couple weeks ago for us, but maybe a couple nights ago for them or a couple days ago? Do you remember Jesus was given a message, Sermon on the Mount or Sermon on the Level, right? He was given that message. Do you think maybe that pierced her heart? Remember she was in that crowd and heard it? Or how about, how about maybe she heard this? Maybe she heard Jesus say this, come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Then remember who she is. I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. You think that's why she's there? I believe, listen, I believe this lady walked in, no matter what her past was, I believe she walked in and she, had, she knew that her sins were forgiven. And she walked in and she gets at his feet and she just can't believe this one is there. And she's weeping. She has this emotional outburst and her tears are so many that they're water on his feet and she begins to wash her feet with her hair. And that's just like, you read, you're reading that and going, that's nuts. And I, I believe, listen, I'm a person when, when people get real emotional, I'm the kind of guy that I kind of get emotional with them. It would be hard to maintain. Wouldn't it be hard to maintain? I mean, especially if you're Jesus. We kind of have this picture, and this is a little funky picture because he's not sitting right, but... I mean, all of a sudden you're sitting there, you're eating, you're having a conversation... We don't know what it was, but all of a sudden this lady is weeping, and if she's weeping, she's weeping loud enough, people are understanding, and tears are going down, and she starts washing your feet. I think I would say, uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, right? I mean, it would be a little strange. And not only that, listen, then she goes a little bit further, and it says, hey, and then, check this out, then she kissed his feet. For reals? Now I'm really uncomfortable. Right? Now it's just awkward. And how are we going to handle this? Oh, and then it says, and she anointed them with fragrant oil. So she took, she went, she went with a purpose. Right? This lady didn't just show up and accidentally bump into Jesus. She knew where Jesus was going to be. She knew what was going to happen. She brings her jar, her alabaster jar. A lot of people say they wore it around their necks, some ladies, I don't know. And hey, she had it there. She's ready. And then she bursts into this emotion. She weeps. She kisses his feet because she loves him so much. And she dumps this oil on it and dumps oil. And all the time, she's wiping him down with her hair. Now that, listen, that had to be a phenomenal scene. Again, Jesus might be uncomfortable, but I think Simon, I think he's like, I think he's like freaking out. Like, this was supposed to be kind of a good dinner party and... I was really going to kind of nail this guy, I think. And now I don't know what to do because this is like very, very uncomfortable. So what do you say, right? What do you do? What do you say? And you're processing things. Here's what I love. You're processing things. You need to be careful if you're processing things in front of Jesus, which we always are, right? Because Jesus knows the hearts and minds of men. And so he's processing. And look at, how, look at how he's processing. Look at what he sees. Oh, by the way, I kind of like what Luther says. Luther says that these tears were heart water. Think about that the next time you're moved emotionally. It's just a little heart water. I love that, don't you? So, hey, she's doing all that. And then it says, now when the Pharisee who, who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. That's called processing, right? He's speaking to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. Why? Because she's a sinner or she's a hooker. 
And he's letting us know, listen, if, if he were a prophet, why did he say if he were a prophet? Because everybody around that area, he's still up in Galilee, everybody around that area is calling him a prophet. Why? He raised a dead woman's son, right? They all saw that. So here's what he said. Maybe that's why he bought, maybe even that's why he invited him to his house. Maybe he's trying to see, are you really a prophet? So if he were a prophet, he would know exactly what's going on. That's what Simon's thinking. And he would know. And it's interesting, the word in the original language, this, who this woman was, who it is touching him, he's saying it in a sexual way in his mind. So his mind's already deviant, right? He's already messed up in his mind. And as Pastor Rob shared in the beginning, he's looking at her in a very, very uh, uh, demeaning and horrible way, in a very judgmental way. Who does she think she, she is? Because in Simon's mind, there were two people, the righteous and spiritual and self-righteous, and the losers. And she was a loser. And so he says, he would know. Why doesn't he know that? She's a sinner. Why would he let a sinner like that touch him and go through that? So he's thinking that. And then I love this. In verse 40, then Jesus answered. I always love this. He didn't ask him a question, right? But he thought it. So Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, that's why he knew his name because it didn't tell us till now. Simon, I have something to say to you. And so he said, teacher, say it. Oh, you're gonna be sorry for that one, right? Now, I believe, listen, if I were Simon, I would say, you know what, dinner's over, go home. <laughs> right, because you say, I got something to say to you. He's saying, say it. Now, I don't know if he thinks, oh, good, we're gonna bust this lady, we're gonna do something. So he says, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, tell me. And this is gonna be, this is gonna be like, Jesus is going to drop a bomb on him. And I love the way Jesus does this. Jesus could have just gone right into it and told him what was going on, right? He could have done everything. But he wants Simon to understand and process what's going on and hopefully touch his heart. But he also wants to encourage this lady who's got to be, you think Jesus felt awkward and Simon felt awkward? How do you think she felt? She had to feel like, I know, listen, I know what I'm doing, and I know it's going to cost me everything. Oh, by the way, in Jewish culture of that time, when a woman let her hair down, that was like going in topless. That was the same equivalent. That's what they felt. So kind of, listen, man, this lady is risking everything. She lets her hair down. Everybody knows who she is. She, you know, had the, number one, the gall to walk in on this dinner. Number two, to be touching this guy and to be weeping over him and pouring this oil. I mean, man, I gotta, I, I gotta respect this lady because a lot of us, we don't demonstrate our faith that way. A lot of us are undercover Christians, right? We make sure nobody knows what we believe. And she's, a, she's like, a, she outs herself, right? I'm, I'm into this. So she does that. Jesus says, Simon, you want to talk? You know what he's going to say? Hey, you want to talk? And he goes, yeah, I say it, teacher. Go ahead, tell me. So Jesus said this. He says, in verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to pay, repay, he freely forgave them both Tell me, Simon, therefore, which of them will love him more? So we can get into details of this, but remember, parables aren't to get into all the details. What is this parable teaching? This parable just has one message. Who's gonna love more, right? Which one is going to love more? And it's kind of like, it's like one of those duh things. Even a Pharisee can get this one right. Right? You don't have to have a, a huge IQ to understand this. So tell me, Simon, what would go on? So Simon, he's locked and loaded. He's ready. He's bright. He's brilliant. So verse 43, Simon said, and Simon answered and said, I suppose, I kind of like that, right? I suppose I don't want to be too committed because um, I'm a Pharisee and maybe even a politician. So I suppose, he says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you've rightly judged. 
Well, that only makes sense, right? The one who gets the most forgiveness is going to love more. That's the cue to what we're going to learn. Because some people get this backwards. The, what we're understanding, this is the truth that we want to learn. What's the truth? The person who's forgiven the most is the one who loves the hardest. Isn't that what he's saying? So that's the truth. So keep that in mind because we can't get this backwards of what's going on. So Jesus said, yeah, you said that right. And then he says, then he turned, I love this, he turned to the woman and said to Simon. That's kind of awkward, right? Like, I don't know where Simon is at the table. But Jesus turns to her and speaks to Simon. Uh Uh-oh. And here's the thing, Simon's gonna feel really, 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 really stupid. Sorry, I know some people don't like that term, but that's what he's gonna feel. So he turns to her and he says, Simon, I love this. Do you see this woman? And it's kind of like, uh, who could miss her? We all know what she is. We all know what she just did. You know, hey, you pour a bottle of perfume out. Everybody's smelling it. Everybody knows what's going on. Of course I see her. And then he does this. I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I the, since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fra- with uh, fragrant oil. Now listen, he just busted him big time and here's what he's saying. I came in and you didn't even show me common courtesy. You didn't even show me just the the common stuff, not even respect. You didn't even show me what you, common courtesy when people come in. And isn't it interesting, different cultures have different things, right? In In the US, our big culture thing is kind of a handshake. Do you want some water? Maybe even give somebody a little bit of a hug. Want some water, sit down, we kind of do that. Other cultures, hey, in France, they kiss each other on each cheek to do that, right? They kind of do that. Other places will bow. All kinds of different things. Where their culture, especially in the first century of Judaism, was like there was a very, very strong uh, kind of cultural uh, bounds of what you do when somebody shows up to your house. So Jesus says, Simon, the one who loves the most is the one who's forgiven the most? Let's kind of analyze that, dude. Because you, you didn't even do common courtesy for me. So what does that say about what you think about me? Now, I wrote down some scriptures in Genesis, in Genesis uh, chapter 18 and Judges chapter 19. Talk about, talk about the idea of washing feet but we also know a lot about washing feet from John chapter 14, right? Hey, that was something you did. Why? Because you're walking in sandals all over in the desert area. Your feet get real funky. And it was just common courtesy when someone came into your home that you would wash your feet. And you would have the lowest slave of all to do that. And that was his duty. That's why it was awesome when Jesus took the towel and did it. But hey, so that was just common courtesy. And here's what he said. Hey, you didn't, you didn't even bother to do that. And then he tells him, hey, then he tells him this. He says, hey, you didn't do that. And then he says, hey, you didn't even give me a kiss and welcome me. Again, Genesis chapter, and remember, Genesis had the Old Testament. That's why I'm sticking to that. Genesis chapter 29, Genesis chapter 45, Exodus chapter 18. He says, hey, you didn't even do that. And again, that was a very common, normal greeting when somebody came in. They would kiss on the cheek, much like they do in, in France today. That was normal. And he goes, you didn't even do that. You didn't even, not even that. Oh, and then the last one, you didn't anoint my head with oil. Because you're living in a desert climate, it's tough, it's hot, it's hard. So you just give them a little olive oil on their head to refresh them. It was just usually normal olive oil. And what does he say? He says, you didn't even do that. Simon, I came into your house and you didn't even show me the common decency and courtesy when I came in. Now, do you think Jesus would have ever brought that up if this woman hadn't shown up? I don't think so. I don't think Jesus was mad about that. 
I think he was like just okay. You know, and some people, hey, some people just, they don't, they don't know the rules, right? Some people don't know etiquette. And it always cracks me up when people get really mad. Well, they didn't do this right. Well, maybe they've never been taught. Like we were all raised in different homes, right? Yeah, and some of our parents taught us things. Some of our parents didn't. My parents didn't do a lot of things that people now today tell me, that's normal. And I go, well, I guess we weren't a normal family because we never did that, you know, and, and just stuff going on. So maybe they weren't taught. Maybe that's what, not what was going on. And so, you know, but he's saying, hey, you didn't do any of that. And yet you're sitting here judging her, judging this woman, and you're judging this woman because of her past. Obviously, this woman had a past. You're judging her because of her past, and you're judging her for what she's doing now, and you're a little upset because she's in your house, and she's kissing my feet, and she's wiping tears away with her hair, and she's pouring oil on them, and you're a little bit freaked out. You're a little bit uncomfortable, and you didn't do any of that, and he says, yeah, she did all of that, and so here's, here's kind of what, I, what, what I love about this. She did that. She changed everything, and so she didn't just wash his feet, but she used her tears. Remember that heart water? She used her tears. She didn't just give him a kiss of greeting, right? Greet one another with a holy kiss. She didn't just do that. She kissed his feet. Somebody said this, because she didn't feel worthy to do any more. And that's, you know, some people call that worm theology. We're just worms, right? And we need to understand, hey, do we deserve salvation? No. But he's so good. This woman understood that. Oh, and then she didn't just use olive oil. She used fragrance. She used expensive oil that probably was, you know, one of her treasures and yet she poured it out and she did all that. So she did all of that. So she went to extreme and Simon went to extreme the other way. And he really kind of blew it. So Jesus points that out to her. And, and here's kind of what I, what I love. When we look at this story, what did Jesus know? Because it's important, right? Well, it's important that we understand God's knowledge. So what did Jesus know? He knew the woman. He knew her past condition. He knew where she came from, but he also knew her present condition, and we're going to find out. So he knew the woman, and then he also, he even knew what Simon was thinking, right? Is Simon's processing that. Those are things he knew, and you and I need to know he's the discerner of the hearts and minds. It always cracks me up when somebody says, oh, so-and-so has a good heart. We don't know a person's heart, right? Right? And we can look at their actions and might say that, but that they could still, people with wicked hearts do kind things. So we don't know. And then here's the one that I think is most important. He's the only one who can forgive sin. So now he's hanging out at this house. This woman is loving on him. Are you kind of getting the point? Why was she loving on him? Because her sins were forgiven. And, you know, I think it's important for all of us to stop and think about Tonight, right now, can you close your eyes and pray and say, Jesus, you know all things, and you know that I love you? Because that's what's important. And we, we should have a deep gratitude. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's what you get saved from. Some people make a big deal out of, well, I was saved out of this and this and this, and, and I get it, but you know what? All of us are saved from the eternal wrath of God. Some of us were bigger sinners. Some of us were really good at it. Some of us were amateur sinners. And we stunk at it, right? Because they just weren't good at it. But hey, anybody who's here tonight is under the blood of Jesus Christ by his grace. And that's amazing. And our salvation is amazing. And so this lady is just loving on him, expressing everything. So Jesus kind of Jesus told Simon, dude, you missed the whole point, bro. Why are you doing this? So then he says, verse 47, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So now he's pointing things out. And some people read this and they go, hey, 
Jesus said her sins are forgiven, uh, uh, therefore I say to you her sins are forgiven. What's the therefore, therefore? Because he just described what she did. So did all of that cause her sins to be forgiven? Say no, please say no. No one say yes. Right? That didn't cause the forgiveness, that was evidence of the forgiveness. And that was an expression of her love because of the forgiveness. She didn't love to get saved. She got saved and loved because she was saved. And I think that's important because, man, you can read this, and I've heard people read this and say, see, if you do certain things, those are good works, and you're saved. No. She did the works because she was saved and who she was, and we need to know that. One person put it this way. I love, let let me read this to you. Here's how they put it. Her love was the effect of her love of her forgiveness, not the cause. The consequences of her forgiveness, not the condition. The result of her forgiveness, not the reason. Or the fruit of forgiveness, not the root. Those are like really drilling down, right? Because that's what the parable taught us, and that's what verse 50 is gonna teach us. So that's what's going on. And then this person wrote about Simon and said, Simon had shown his guests so little love because he felt under no obligation and had no consciousness of having obtained forgiveness and no sense of debt to Jesus. You know, I always think when, whenever we're doing worship and stuff, and I don't look around, generally when I'm doing worship, I got my eyes closed and I'm worshiping God. And we all should be doing that. But man, are we worshiping God? And are we grateful for what he's done? Or are we just doing church? Even if we come twice a week, come on Thursday and come on the weekend, are we just coming because that's what Christians do and that's what I'm supposed to do? Or are we coming because we love him and because we want to hang out with him and we want to hear from him and we want to be in his presence? I think, listen, I think, man, I think uh, some of us, we're a whole lot more like Simon than we are like the lady. Oh, and by the way, bummer that we don't know her name. I'm sure it was Mary. Every woman in the Bible is Mary. But if I said Mary, then the other two that we talked about, their names were Mary, her, their names were Mary, so I don't want to do that. So we'll call her Jane. But I mean, it's incredible. Isn't it incredible? When we get to heaven, we're going to have to say, hey, hooker, hooker that washed Jesus' feet, where are you? How else are we going to know her, right? And we've got to like, find her, but we don't even know her name, and yet, look at what she does and a lot more of us are like Simon than we are like the hooker, I guess. So, you know, than we are like her. And man, we need to be more like her, don't we? Broken, broken before our God because of what he's done. I don't care how long you've walked with God. I don't care how, quote, saved you are. Man, it never gets old of thinking what he's done for us and the fact that he loved us when we were still sinners when we're in that place. So here's what he says. You know, again, he says, hey, Simon, verse 47 is just amazing. I want want you to know something. Her sins, which are many, they're forgiven because she loved much. But Simon, Simon, pay attention, right? Simon, he who loves little, and, and, uh, but he who, uh, who, whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. That's who you are, Simon, because you don't realize. You don't realize, number one, you're a sinner who need to be saved, and you don't realize how precious salvation is. You're just looking at her judging. And so then Jesus turns to her. Look at what he says to her. Your sins are forgiven. Again, people say, see, her sins are forgiven because she cried on Wash his feet, did the oil, kissed his feet. No, what is Jesus doing right here? He's letting her know, hey man, this is really awkward for all of us. But you need to know something, your sins are forgiven. He's given her reassurance. He's reminding her, yes, your sins are forgiven. You're okay. Even though you busted into this party, even though you kind of crashed it big time, and even though you freaked a lot of people out, you need to know your sins are forgiven. And isn't it good that Jesus reassures us that our sins are forgiven and gives us that assurance 
of our salvation. So he says that to her, just giving her assurance. And then remember, remember, this isn't just Jesus and Simon and this lady. There's a dinner party going on. So all the other people are going, what did we just witness, right? Check it out. And those who sat at the table or reclined at the table, right, with, uh, reclined at the table with them, began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Here's what they're going. Who does this guy think he is? Now he's going around forgiving sins. He, we thought he was a prophet, but who is this? Because here's what they know. Hey, you got to think about who's going to be at a Pharisee's house for dinner. Pharisees, thank you. Yeah, who's going to be hanging out with a bunch of self-righteous, creepy people? It's a bummer. It's always a bummer to be around self-righteous people. Maybe I don't know. Maybe you guys really feel good about yourselves. I get around self-righteous people, and I am so uncomfortable because here's what I know. I'm a sinner, and I get around self-righteous people, and here's, they're judging me. Maybe I'll wash someone's feet. That's maybe what I'll do next time I'm in that. But you got all these self-righteous people. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Now he's going around forgiving sins. So Jesus said, excuse me, I didn't mean to offend anybody. I can't believe we went through this. I love, listen, here's what he says. He says, hey, just in case you guys really don't think this happened, just in case you're not sure, here's what he said. Then he said to the woman, your works have saved you, go in peace. Because that's what some people think. What did he say? Your faith. Hey, Jane, your faith has saved you. And you demonstrated your faith by what you did here tonight. Just the fact that you walked through those doors is pretty amazing. Some people make this outdoor. I don't know if it's outdoor in a courtyard, but she had to go through a gate or something. Just because you walked through that was amazing enough knowing who you are, but the fact that you did what you did, man, that demonstrates the fact that you are forgiven and your amazing faith. Now listen, I'm not saying it's faith because what she washed the feet and stuff. I'm saying it's faith because she came out and let everybody know, I love him. I love him because he saved me. And so he says, hey, your faith, and then I love this. Here's what he says. Your faith has saved you, shalom. And she said, yeah, I'm gonna shalom right on out of here. It's so good, so good. Isn't it good to know we're forgiven? Isn't it good to know that he cleanses us? I love that, isn't this a great passage? I mean, this whole chapter's good. This chapter, we could, listen, maybe we'll do it again. We'll just start, rewind and do it again. It's just good. And so Jesus, listen, Jesus starts out by, by saving or by, by uh, healing that centurion servant, and then he raises the, the dead guy. He encourages John. He insults the, he insults the, Phar or the Pharisees. Then he goes to the Pharisee for dinner, insults the Pharisees some more, and encourages this lady in her faith. Because here's what I know. If we come to Jesus honestly and openly, he will always encourage us. He will never put us down. He'll never shoo us away. He'll never try and get rid of us. He will always, always strengthen and encourage us. So you know what? We need to run to Jesus. And we need to hang out with him. Let's stand up and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for God, your gift that you've given us, this salvation that we have. And we just praise you. We praise you tonight that we can claim this gift of eternal life, just like this lady. She maybe didn't verbally outward say things, but she demonstrated her faith through her actions. And even as we sang that one song, sometimes our actions are much louder than our words. So I do pray, Lord, I pray for every single one of us here tonight. God, make us like this lady. We don't wanna be Pharisees. We don't want to be self-righteous people. Even in, even in the midst of our salvation, we can become very self-righteous. And we don't want to do that. We want to be humble people. We want to walk humbly with our God. And we want to exalt you. So Lord, draw our hearts close to your heart. 
And if anyone's in here who doesn't know you, right now, touch that heart. Touch that individual just like this woman was touched. So I'm going to ask everybody to stay in that attitude of prayer. And tonight, if you are here and you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, then you know what? Tonight's the night of salvation. Right now is the time. Call on his name, the Bible says, and you will be saved. So we just want to challenge you to do that right now, right where you're standing, that you can let Jesus know, hey, I want to be saved. I want to know you. I want to love you like this woman loved you. So if that's a cry of your heart, if, if that's in your heart, then you need to be real and honest with God. So if you're asking him to save you, you gotta be asking him to save you from something. And that thing is his eternal wrath. So you gotta come to the place where you know you're a sinner. And I don't think that should be hard for any of us because we're all sinners. So you gotta admit to him you're a sinner. You gotta understand your sin separated you from God. And your sin now has earned you his eternal wrath. That's the bad news, the great news again, as we come to him broken people, hurting people, we come to him, and here's what we understand as we come to him, he can take away that wrath that we deserve, and he can give us eternal life. All you have to do is come and be honest like this lady. So if you wanna do that, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Say this prayer after me. It's got to be sincere. It's got to come from your heart. You can't just utter it. It's got to be real. But man, as you say this prayer, God will hear you. And tonight will be the night of salvation for you. If you're watching online, you can say the prayer right where you're at. If you're here tonight and you're backslidden, man, if you're backslidden, you got to like this lady. And this lady's got to cause you to front slide. Come home. Come back to Jesus. Let's say this prayer together. Jesus, tonight... I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you tonight for your forgiveness. And now I'm asking you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, come into my life and guide me. Tonight, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. 